Hello, Facebook. Hello, Nashville. Hello, the world. We are here tonight to celebrate, and he's going to kill me when I say this, a god among literature. <laughs> <laughs> My friend Greg Isles, who has written a book called Mississippi Blood, which y'all are here to hear us talk about. We're going to talk about the book. We're going to talk about some secrets in the book. We're going to talk about Greg's process. We're going to talk about all kinds of things. And we're going to take calls from the fans. And we're going to read off some questions. So you guys start pouring them in. And Greg's going to sign some books while we do this. And this is going to be a very casual event. We're going to have a good time. And since we're both live signing virgins, we're, you know, we're here doing it together. <laughs> we're losing our virginity we're together. We're losing our virginity together. Yep, here we go. <laughs> are you ready? And our husband and wife are over here. This could get, get ugly. They are laughing at us right now. <laughs> so I, I had the honor of interviewing you last year for The Bone Tree. And now I get to do this again for Mississippi Blood, which I finished and literally put the book down and went, my God, how did he do that? And then you cursed me because it was so long. I no, well, I actually was kind of fascinated that for a book that is so long, I never felt a moment's drag. And it has this incredibly blistering pace that it just goes and goes and goes and goes. I, 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 I say I drank it into, I mean, I literally sat down over two days and read the whole book because I couldn't stop. And it never lagged. And Maybe that's the amazing. best accomplishment is that the first two books, people don't realize the first two books, that's 1,600 pages, and that happens in about five days. I know. <laughs> you don't realize it, I think, when you're reading the book. No, it's that not short at all. Of time. So how do you do that? I mean, tell, tell us a little bit about the book. We, we don't want to step on what the book is before we start talking about how you create the magic. Tell us about the book. Well, this book um, began to be a single book novel back in 2011. And uh, I was writing about the South, my family, race, and I felt that one book couldn't contain it. Mm -hmm. And when I started thinking it was gonna have to be two books, JT, you know that's not something a publisher wants to hear, you know. And uh, when I was starting to have arguments with my publisher at the time, I pulled onto Highway 61 and a truck hit my driver's door going 70 miles an hour and took my leg off here, it's no big thing. Um, yeah, tore my aorta, no shattered thing. my pelvis, my legs, my ribs, my arm. And I woke up out of a coma a week later, and I just had a completely different vision of the book at that time. And I just said, I'm not going to worry about the commercial realities, exigencies, whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to write it the, the South the way it is, and we'll let the chips fall. And uh, I hoped that would lead to immediate happy ending, but it did not. I lost my agent, my publisher, and uh, it was five years. I had the number one book prior to Natchez Burning in five years and nothing. Mm -hmm. So it was a real gamble to do this and a miracle it turned out, you know. I don't know that it's a miracle because you're an incredibly talented author and there was, I think they're idiots for walking away and I hope, I, I know that you held no ill will towards everybody making decisions that they make, it's all business, but I hope that there's a slight bit of vindication in this for you. You know what it is, when you're somebody like me, you realize you, you sometimes put people in a bad position. I mean, people are in business to make money, and sure. you're dealing with an artist who's like, the hell with making money? <laughs> you know, that's a tough, that's a tough nut for people. So, uh, yeah, no hard feelings. That's good. So, talk a little bit about, this is the third book. This is the end of the, the great Natchez trilogy. And tell us a little bit about the story. Okay, well, in Mississippi Blood, Finally, people get the answers to all the questions they've wanted since that first book, yeah. as you know, since you finished it. But I mean, for anybody tuning in who doesn't know, and they think this idea, my God, three books, three quarters of a million words, do I even want to start something so huge, you know, three doorstops? The thing I want to say is that it's really a story of a, an adult, but as, you know, we all go through this thing where we grow up where we think our parents are perfect. And then at either age 14, you may be 40, mm -hmm. you learn they're not perfect, they have feet of clay. And Penn, like me, had a father who wasn't just beloved by himself, but by his entire community. He was raised by a saint, sort of. And then late in life, his father's accused of murdering his African-American nurse from back in the 60s, and the son starts to realize, okay, the way I've seen life all my life, I've seen my upbringing, is not what I thought. One reviewer said, imagine Jim Finch grew up to learn things about Atticus no son should ever know about his father. 
That's really what it gets at. Yeah. And then the larger issue of these books, of course, is they're based around real life murders that happened in Fairty, Louisiana, near my hometown. And a heroic reporter did a lot of work, and one of my characters is based on him. So this is the South, warts and all, good it and is. bad. And, and I hope, you know, I hope people come to like it. That's, I think, one of the things that you do so well, which is the South. And, and the parts of it that nobody wants to talk about and nobody wants to look at and are really, even nationally now, finally under a microscope. Do you think that these books can change the way people view the South? I, and view race? I'm starting to find out that they have. You know, here's the irony. When I started writing Natchez Burning, people were first starting to talk about America as a post-racial society. Yeah. Now, I don't think one person in North America would say America is a post-racial society. Yeah. But the other thing that's come out is Mississippi and the South have always been the whipping boy for the nation on race. Oh, isn't that racism terrible down there in Mississippi? And what the last three years have revealed yeah. is Look, the worst incidents are not happening in Selma, Alabama or Natchez, Mississippi. They're happening all over the country. Right. So it's finally the scar has been torn away and we see that race is a national issue that has to be dealt with nationally. That's awesome. Um, I'm going to take a question uh, from okay. Gregory in Winston-Salem. Okay. What I find most engaging in this trilogy is your ability to tap into the unique bond that exists between phys physicians and their patients. It is this bond that we as physicians treasure and find so energizing. How did you gain such accurate insight into this unique relationship? That's, that's one of the best questions I ever got. Um, my father was a physician, an old time physician, and a guy who was selfless, cared only about his patients, nothing about making money. The other thing he cared about was books. Spent his whole life treating people and building up a library, that's all. But I worked for him as a child. I, took blood from people, I even stitched up people, Did neighbors you? and stuff. And then between being a musician and struggling and doing my first book, I worked for him as well. And so I saw firsthand what it's like to work for a doc who, you know, takes a bucket of catfish for payment or a bucket of mustard greens. And um, medicine is still, even though it's completely different from when he practiced, it's still a noble profession and, and all docs know that and they, they yeah. go through a lot to, to do what they do. That's awesome. Tom is one of my favorite characters. I mean, how can he not? He's such I a great know. guy. He's a great guy that does the wrong thing for the right reason, right? Yes. Isn't that the... I'm going to be careful about spoilers, but I mean, that's yeah. what, what I think the truth, the, the hardest thing about these books is that even a guy like Tom, we realize we all have things in our past that are tough and we made bad choices and people got hurt. And that's you know, you come to a place almost in life, you come to choices where you realize there is no clean, positive decision. All you're doing is distributing the pain. And a little bit, that's what th this book is about. Yeah. All right, let's do another one from Kathy in Atlanta. You clearly love Mississippi in the South. It comes through so clearly in your writing, and especially in the Natchez Burning Trilogy. But it's a love complicated by Mississippi's racial past, which you explore with brutal honesty. How do you come to terms with this wonderful, beautiful place that raised you and that dark history? As a Southerner, I wrestle with it too. It, for me, it's like this. When I'm in Mississippi, I'm one of the most vocal critics of the state, you know, and uh, I do what I can. A few months ago, John Grisham and I <clears throat> organized a lot of the artists in Mississippi, writers, the SEC coaches, old pro heroes like Archie Manning, Morgan Freeman, Jimmy Buffett. Um, just everybody and Mississippi has a strong literary tradition to try to get the Confederate flag removed from mm -hmm. the state flag and we haven't been successful yet but at least we sort of flew our flag that Mississippi's not all the old way looking backward but so when I'm home I'm critical but when I'm away like if I'm in New York or we fly to Michigan on tour and I hear somebody bad mouth in the south I'm ready you know I'm yeah. ready to fight to defend it it's like your family okay it's uh there are single counties in Mississippi, especially during the 60s, single counties that had more African Americans than five, six northern states put together. So when Yankees pontificate about racism, frequently they didn't know what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. And as soon as large numbers of African Americans moved north to get jobs and better housing, racism suddenly became a thing in the north. You know, So it's one of the most difficult questions. I still live in Mississippi. I'm, I know I'm talking too much, but I'm going to end with something a friend of Morgan Freeman's told me, he said, they said, uh, Morgan, you can live anywhere in the world, obviously, 
why when you're not making movies do you live in Mississippi? And he said, because I can live anywhere in the world. Very nice. Now, it doesn't get any better than that. No, it doesn't. All right, I'm going to give you one that you can answer quickly. Brian from Hendersonville, North Carolina, not Tennessee. Who's the better guitar player, you or Stephen King? <laughs> <laughs> Steve is the better entertainer by far. I probably know a few more chords, but believe me, Steve could pack a house and tear it down, and uh, I'd have about six people attending. Hey, why don't you sign some books? Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's sign some books, and while right. we're doing that, um, I'm going to ask you something easy that you can answer while you're writing your name. Where do you find your inspiration? Oh. <laughs> you find inspiration. I have written an entire book out of a single smile. A girl at a soccer game gave me who looked like a dead lover of mine. And on the other hand, I've written a huge book based in a historical mystery with years of research. I mean, inspiration can come from anywhere. anywhere. You know that. Sure. Sure, absolutely. Um, Oh, I want to ask that one much later. Um, oh, this is a good one. I, too, experienced near death 10 years ago and have found that I am more creative than I was before. Do you feel the same? I admire your tenacity, and I'm eternally thankful that you live to see Penn Cage evolve. That's from Libby, Libby in Mandeville, Louisiana. Thank you, Libby. Um, you know, anybody can say this. And at the age I'm getting to be and friends, you see, Mortality is tapping a lot of us on the shoulder, sure. you know, so really it's just that my near-death experience may have been a little nearer than some people, but you You just realize you don't have forever to deal with every idea you want to deal with and so I don't know if it affects your creativity, but it affects your productivity. I would say that's no, that's a good thing Actually, I, I'm curious. That's a good segue into what is your productivity? How do you do this? I mean, these are big books. You know, how many words do you write a day? Good day for me is 30 pages a day. Okay. And I really don't change very much. Okay. My agent doesn't like me to say that because young writers think, hey, I don't, I don't have to change anything. But, uh, well, you've been doing it long enough. You know. I know. I did it that way from the start. Right. I did it that way from the start. I, I'm sort of insane, and I'll cut this short, but I go a lot of the year not writing at all. Mm -hmm. And it's just working itself out passively. Get Stephen King's book on writing. He talks a lot about passive processing. And you'll, you'll understand what I'm talking about. But I reach a point, I compare it to like when a pregnant woman's water breaks. Like, finally it's all there and it's got to come out. I run to that chair. I have an easy chair thing and multi-monitors. And I sit there drinking ice cold tab and eating granola bars. I work 12, 18 hours a day. And near the end, I work 24 hours at a time, even 36 hours at a time, doing 30 pages a day. For me, that works. Mm -hmm. But I know best-selling number one authors who write three pages a day, go bush hog the yard, and write the first page of their next book when they finish this one. You know, everybody's different. Everybody's different. Everybody's different. Uh, I had to pull this one because Deanna is from Castle Rock, Colorado, which is the closest major town to where I grew up. Um, I too am from a very, very small town, but when I say small town, it had a gas station and a post office. Um, so she's from Castle Rock and she wants to know if you're going to come to Denver. Am I going to come to Denver? I, you know, I'll be glad to come to Denver. I came there once to play with the Rock Bottom Remainders, the band I play in with, um, you know, the other writers, Stephen King and Amy Tan, Amy Tan Dave Barry and everybody. And I got to meet Mayor Hickenlooper at the time. Right? Really? And, uh, no way. <laughs> yeah. He, he hung out with us in the green room and stuff. You know, it was fun. And I love Colorado, and I'm coming up there to see a friend, but to sign books. I don't, I don't think I'll be there for a while. Well, maybe you can stop at that Barnes & Noble and Lone Tree and sign some stock, and okay. then you can go up and get one of those from there. All right. While we're here, I'm going to write a special message to somebody, whoever gets this book, okay? Um, I don't know how they decide who that person is, but here we go. You go ahead. Keep going. I, I go answer. ahead. No, I'll see. I will interpretive dance while he writes a special message that I do not want to distract from. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. We talked about that. Uh, gosh, that's, I got to ask you this. Danny from Texarkana wants to know how things are in our hometown. I guess he's talking about Natchez. I know I guess a lot so. of Danny's from Natchez. He should have put his name on there. Uh, <laughs> things are okay. It's shrinking. I'm trying. A lot of us are trying to take it back, bring it back to what it used to be. But uh, 
it's tough. You know, a lot of little towns in Mississippi are shrinking, dying, and uh, sometimes the state government uh, is not exactly pulling on the gate in the same direction. Yeah. You know what I mean? You are doing a lot of Lord's work there trying to get that working. Don, from Yorktown, Virginia, how do you come up with your unique and complex characters? And that's on my list, too. So good question, Don. Uh, when you're writing about, you know, KKK splinter cells, <laughs> it's not too hard to come up with unique characters. If you live in the backwoods of Mississippi and uh, Louisiana, you know, there's a few deliverance characters going up and down the aisles of the Walmart. It's, uh, I'm, and I'm not being, I'm not downing the state. I'm just saying, if you, you know, if you live where I live, uh, there are characters aplenty. Characters aplenty. Um, well, that was my, one of my questions as well, because I think, and we've talked about this in the past, you do an absolutely brilliant job with your female characters. And that Thank they you. are so alive in the book, and especially the female characters that, that come to the fore here. Serenity, for example. Um, how do you really tap into that? I mean, obviously you're an observer. An observer, but I, I mean, I, we're on the internet, so we can say what we want to say, but I mean, I'm gonna be honest for the real writers out there. Writing cross gender is about the hardest thing anybody can do. Men notoriously are at least criticized for not doing it well. Mm -hmm. I think because women are the main consumers of women authored books, women authored books, they always assume women did it well. It's just, there's some very famous books written by women from a male point of view that I think failed utterly, you know? Um, what I do is I just, I didn't just observe, but I listened my whole life to my mother, my grandmother, the girls in my neighborhood, the girlfriends I had, you know, every, every relationship. You, when you're a writer, you know, you're basically just a sponge all the time. You know, why can Stephen King write the kid in The Shining, and when you read it, you, f you remember exactly what it's like to be that age. Exact, you don't just, it's not cerebral, you just feel it, mm -hmm. you know? So if you're gonna write cross-gender, you've gotta be able to inhabit that skin and get it to that point, and if you can't, just don't fool with it. Don't bother. Yeah. Well, you do a darn good job of it. Thank you. Uh, this is not a question, but I grew up in Natchez. This is Barbara from South Burlington, Vermont. This is not a question, but I grew up in Natchez. I've been away for 40 years, living in a frozen climate. Natchez remains my home with all of my best friends still there. I read Stanley Nelson's book after reading the first two in the trilogy. It's strange to realize those devils were so close. Anyway, my father was Dr. Isles, Thursday morning, early fishing buddy. Wow. So there's somebody well, from home. There's a lot in there. Let me, let me put a plug in here while I can. They mentioned Stanley Nelson's book. Stanley Nelson was the heroic journalist I mentioned. He's the basis of Henry Sexton and Natchez Burning. He's a guy from a tiny little newspaper in Faraday, Louisiana, home of Jimmy Swaggart and Jay Lee Lewis. Subscriber base 5,000. He outpaced what the FBI had done in 40 years, and he only lost the Pulitzer to the spotlight team that broke the Catholic Church scandal. And he just has a book out, Devil's Walking, about the real life cases that inspire the trilogy. So Stanley Nelson, Devil's Walking, you gotta get it. Awesome, okay. awesome. Put that in the liner notes. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Why don't we read a little bit? Oh my God, okay, yeah. We're gonna read. We're gonna read, we're gonna read. Normally I never read, I'm gonna say that right now. They'll, they'll always advertise on tour. <laughs> Greg Isles will be reading at next time, and I get there and say, I am not reading. I can't imagine anything more boring than somebody sitting there reading. But I'm going to hope that I can be like a James Lee Burke or somebody with some character here. So just a little of the prologue. Grief is the most solitary emotion. It makes islands of us all. I've spent a lot of time visiting graves over the past few weeks, sometimes with Annie, but mostly alone. The people who see me there give me a wide berth. I'm not sure why. For 30 miles around, almost everyone knows me. Penn Cage, the former mayor of Natchez, Mississippi. When they avoid me, waving from a distance, if at all, then hurrying on their way, I sometimes wonder if I have taken on the mantle of death. Jewel Washington, the county coroner and a true friend, pulled me aside in City Hall last week and told me I look like living proof that ghosts exist. Maybe they do. Since Caitlin died, I have felt like nothing more than the ghost of myself. Perhaps that's why I spend so much time visiting graves. 
I'll quit there. So that's enough. Well, it's, it's perfect. And, and we'll go right to Linda's question. Why did Caitlin have to die? Oh, my God. I know. I realized I read a spoiler right there in that passage. I'm an idiot. Sorry, anybody out there. I probably shouldn't even answer this question. And you know what? I, I can do a little repair work by saying I've gotten a thousand emails asking if she's even really dead. Women are like, I know she's in this witness protection in this book somewhere. Too. This, is, this is from a previous it's from this the last from book the prior last to this. Book, so. But because a lot of people are coming to the trilogy probably late, late. Let's, let's, let's lay off that one a little bit. You, I'm not going to say for sure what happened to Kayla. I, I, that's, I don't think she's read the whole book. Let's see, Gr Gerald Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Now that you've finished the trilogy, my question is, what's next for Greg Isles? Whatever it is, I will be reading it. Wow. And so will I. I'm writing a book right now that's set at Ole Miss, where I went to college, the home of William Faulkner and the Ole Miss Rebels, John Grisham. Donna Tart was educated there. Um, I went to school there in the 80s and studied under Willie Morris, and, and a lot of writers were there in that program then. And it's just a really cool place. And I've got a great sort of film noir, double indemnity idea that's sort of almost like a film noir on paper. And I, I got to take a break from writing 800 page tomes, you know? So this one's going to be tighter. Tight. And then I've gotten some opportunity, it looks like, to maybe work in some TV, extended drama, binge watching series. And I may take a little break to do some of that too. Is this still in the it works? It still is, but it's on, it's off, it's on, it's yes. off. I've learned that being a movie producer is, uh, when you're, you said, you know, at the Thank beginning list. you made the God <laughs> reference. Yeah. When you're writing a novel, you're God of the universe and you can do what you want. When you're dealing with movie studios or co-producers or actors, it's a different world. Different you know, world. committee is an animal with four hind legs, right? So <laughs> Churchill said that. That's awesome. <laughs> And that's, I've, got, I've got one from here, but I want to ask one of my own. What is it about the South that produces so many incredible writers? Not that the rest of the country doesn't, but it seems like, and especially Mississippi, has really turned out some phenomenal, introspective, talented people. What, what is it about the South that does that to us? My original agent had this theory, which I laughed at at the time, but may be true. She said, great suffering produces great art. That's a simple answer. But when you look at Mississippi and realize it produced Faulkner and Elvis and the blues as an entire art form and many other things I could name, it certainly seems an inordinate amount of, of talent came out of there, not to mention NFL football players. But the reason <laughs> the South does, I think, is because, especially now, America's becoming more and more homogenized. I'm on tour, I get off at every exit and everywhere looks the same. There's the P.F. Chang, there's the Bonefish Grill, there's the fake mall that looks like America looked in 1910, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and it all smells the same, looks the same, sounds the same. You get off the interstate in Mississippi, you somewhere, you know where you are. Mm -hmm. but the sense of place is just pervades your body. It's in the air. A guy, there was a line in a book from the 60s that says the sense of fear in Mississippi is like an extra molecule in the air. Now, we don't still have that feeling, but it's a very close place. Plus, here's another thing. You come somewhere in Nashville, I can say, where are you from? Where are you from? You from Nashville? Well, they don't know. I'm from Georgia. Colorado. I'm from here. I'm from there. Mm -hmm. Mississippi, where are you from? Well, I'm one mile up the road. Where's your mom from? One mile up the road. You can go back five, six, seven generations. Now, when you have that kind of tradition, that kind of sense of place, you get storytellers out of that. I don't know why, but you do. It's amazing. Uh, Russell from Coldwater, Mississippi. My favorite holiday to spend in Natchez was Christmas. What is your favorite holiday in Natchez and why? <laughs> every day is a holiday but that I, that I, don't, that I don't have to be behind that computer work and every day is a holiday let's see were you read to as a young boy Francis from Bartlett Tennessee wants to know oh sure yeah my mom read to me and my dad taught me 10 words a day for a while till he got sick of it uh, <laughs> uh, but mostly I mean I just read you know I just read night and day consumed and I think that's what most writers did that's how you learn and I think you're either born a writer or you're a writer by the time you're seven or eight years old mm -hmm. that's my feeling well, stuff I learned in college or whatever that's just it's way too late by then I agree know? I agree completely um, let's sign some more books 
Let's see, can we move those off onto yes, the? Yes, we can. And I've got one. I've got a special one here that we need from Marilyn in Denham Springs, Louisiana. Marilyn, we're going to get this book signed for you, and it is to be in memory of Catherine. It's her recently deceased sister, who was your biggest fan. Okay, and let's K -A -T -H -E -R -I -N -E. spell Catherine. K a t h e r i n e. Gotcha. That's very sweet. Make sure I get that spell. Oh, I love this question. <laughs> this is a great question. <laughs> oh, go. just to uh, remind you guys, these signed copies that we're doing right now are available at MississippiBlood.com. And you can go on there and get your book. And I think if you write in now, you can get it personalized and everything. No, never mind. <laughs> don't, do, don't do that. Don't listen to me. I don't. I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> let, while we got a little moment, well, let me plug JT. JT <laughs> Ellison right here. Look her up on Amazon. Get her books. She's on the bestseller list right now, but I'm hoping I knock her off next Wednesday. He's going to knock me off. He's going to knock me off, and I'm going to be thrilled to have him I'll do it. I feel guilt, but only, as Mark Zuckerberg said, the minimum amount. <laughs> Thank you for that plug. That oh, is yeah. very sweet. I'm, I'm a Nashville author, and uh, I, that's why I got roped into coming here and hanging out and doing all the Nashville stuff with him. So that's good. I'm glad you came to Tam. Thank you. Uh, okay. We, let me do this one before we do that. What did you feel? This is Diane in Lincolnton, North Carolina. What did you feel when you finished Mississippi Blood? I can imagine you felt as if you had birthed a baby after a long, difficult labor. Yeah, I, I felt tired. That sounds like a joke, but it's not really a joke. Uh, it took eight years to write this trilogy. When I started, I felt like a young man. I had both legs. My kids were kids. When I finished, I got one leg. I looked like Santa Claus, and my son's at UVA, and my daughter graduated from college. So this took a lot out of me. And um, what can you say? You just, it's hard to even look back on this tour. You mm -hmm. know, you, you put something like this behind you. I feel like an actor who just finished a movie months ago and now I'm on the talk show circuit and they say, so tell us about that movie and you're, you're on to the next thing, you know, but I have to remember this is, people are just coming to it. So you have to, you know, dwell, but it's hard to do that. I like, I'm lucky, you know, most writers, and I, I say this not in any criticism, but this is a business and Usually when you have best-selling novels, publishers want you to basically rewrite that novel over and over, over again. And over. I've always fought against that, and I've always written about whatever interests me. And therefore, it, it's hard to... I stayed especially on a long time on the South and civil rights murder and all that, and it, it's time to, to go on, you know? I mean, not for other people. I hope they read it, but for me. Well, I think it's, I think it's awesome. A lot of writers would be at the end of this magnum opus, which it has been called. I mean, th th these books are lauded in a way that your books, your Before, books have always been very, very popular, but not, like but not like this. This is different. This is, you've leveled up, as we say, <laughs> <laughs> you've leveled up in a big way. And I admire that, you know, we ask, what are you doing? You're writing another novel. You're a writer. That's what a writer does. That's right. A writer writes. That's right. And you... I mean, what else would you do? I, I feel what terrible. I'm looking at my wife over here, and I can say honestly, I haven't taken a vacation in eight years. For me, a vacation is doing a different kind of work. I've been doing this so long, I can't uh, remember what it felt like not to be doing it, and I get nervous if I'm not doing it. I, I, I don't know. If you got the answer to that, anybody, write in. So, you know, <laughs> write in. Yeah. Other than chemicals, you know, I don't... Yeah, we want to do this all natural. Yeah. <laughs> Um, since you're signing, can you sign one more book yep. here? This is for Eddie in Scottsdale, Arizona, and he would like it autographed to my friend Eddie, my, my friend and fan Eddie. All right, I got to it. My friend it and now. fan Eddie. Got it. Awesome. All right, it's time. It's time for 24 questions in two minutes. I reserve the right to skip on some of you, these. You, you can pass. We can do this like a game show. I you know, you can fifth. pass and I'll come back to it. Okay. Oh, Lord. Oh, God. Where's our pyramid? Don't we need a pyramid behind us for this? This is the nightmare of a perfectionist or OCD <laughs> person right here. <laughs> okay. You ready? Yeah. Who inspired you the most? Oh, my father, who's no longer with us. Excellent. Who would you like to trade places with if you could? Nobody or Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just 
Are I you take driving it, I that take Lincoln? His, you know, no, I'm not. Oh, no. Okay. All right. Ford Flex. Throw in a plug. Right. There you there. go. <laughs> uh, who is the one fictional character you'd love to date? Date? Mm-hmm. No spouses are listening. Smilla Jasperson from Smilla Sense of Snow. Okay. Who makes you laugh the most? Dave Chappelle right now. Oh, I love him. Remind me to say something about that afterward. Uh, who is the most unexpected person we'll find in your phone? I plead the fifth. <laughs> oh, okay. Who's the last person you call it or text? My wife and prior to that, my daughter. Okay. Family. Family man. Family. Uh, what one thing do you need to have in your fridge at all times? Ice cold tab. Ice cold tab. And it's in the book. Tab should be paying you money. They man. should be. They should be. There's paying a sponsorship me some money. deal there for Ford and Tab. Here you go, Mr. Ross. I, I got to tell you my one quick Tab story. This is so great. I had a I had a guy who's a sales rep at one of my things I was doing, and he said, "I noticed you mentioned Tab in your books, and you're addicted." He said, "I got to tell you something." And this guy was in uh, Amarillo, Texas, I believe. He said, "You know, I live by the drummer of ZZ Top." And I play golf with him sometimes. He said, you're not going to believe it. When we go play golf, he's got a little six-pack ice chest full of tab every time. So you and ZZ Top got something in common. I love that. <laughs> That's awesome. That was the greatest drink ever. I can't believe you can still get it. Uh, well, I think they, well, God, I'm going to get in trouble. I think they only sell it in the South. It's like a plot. You know, yeah. they, they want to give it to us for some reason. Yeah, we don't know. there's something in it. Maybe that's what's fueling all the that, beautiful maybe it writers is. out of Mississippi. Northerners are going to start buying it no, now. Now I'm going to start because I want that inspiration. <laughs> Tab, put it on the grocery list. Uh, let's see. What is the greatest horror story of all time? Oh, the greatest horror story of all time. That's hard to say. I, maybe maybe Bram Stoker's Dracula. I'll throw that out there. Some Stephen King. Peter Straub, Ghost Story. Boom. Coco, The Throat. Boom. Mic drop. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Plenty. Whew. Peter Straub is god of literature. I'll say that. He, he is. I read that story when I was little. Little. I couldn't go to the bathroom by myself at night for months. I still can't go to the bathroom by myself. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just had to get you there. I don't like the dark. I still don't <laughs> like the dark. There's still a nightlight. Thanks a lot, Mr. Straub. Appreciate that. What's the best thing about being from Mississippi? Being from Mississippi. What was the last gift you gave? <laughs> Probably flowers, I think. Nice. Oh, we like flowers. What's the weirdest thing a fan has ever said to you? I'm your number one fan ever since Steve's book. I, I do cringe a little bit when I hear that. And they're even self-conscious when they tell you that because they've seen misery. But you still, you sort of, you give a double look in those eyes trying to make sure there's not, you know, the little hog face or something, you know, like in the movie. Well, Sorry, I know I'm getting a little weird there. but No, if it'll make you feel better when I met Tess Gerritsen, I went up to say that. But I said, Tess, you're my number one fan. Uh, there you go. Now that's bad. Uh, what was item? Bad. It was really mortifying. <laughs> what item would you die to get your hands on if it went up for auction? I bought it the other day. <gasps> what? Uh, baritone acoustic guitar built by a guy who built me two baritone guitars, and he died at age 50, tragically, one of the best luthiers in the world. And his personal guitar had a laughing hyena inlaid on the headstock, and it's been up for sale forever. And when I finished this trilogy, my wife finally said, just get over it and just do it and I bought it at auction so that's awesome uh, what hand do you write with I write with this right here Qu three quarters of a million words with those really? fingers right there that's a pretty scary thought really if I look back Wow. but I write I do write at night right handed like falling asleep I just write on a legal path deep so you do both you'll actually long the write book, if you the book to. goes down in the computer but yeah. sometimes you know when you get all key, it's like being done with a musical gig. You lay in that bed and your mind's just whoosh. I couldn't just lay in the bed and go to sleep. So it's almost like discharging a battery. And I can't always read it, but sometimes I get something great. From yeah, that. that's awesome. Uh, what's your worst habit? Procrastination. Really? Sure. Says the man with three quarters of a million words. Yeah, I get it. I get it. Uh, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Alive and vertical, I hope. That's where I see myself. That's all that you matters. Know. Where do you want to go that you've never been? Greek islands. Never been to the Greek islands. Nice. Where would you spend your retirement? 
alive and vertical. I won't ever retire. Are you kidding me? Never. No. <laughs> I'm going to ask you these 20 questions in a minute. <laughs> How do you like your coffee? Dark, black, whatever. How important is music to you? Music is everything, man. I'm traveling. I had to play on a radio show, like third gig, and that gave me an excuse. Even though we're schlepping, the car is so full you can't even get in it. And my wife wouldn't have let me bring a guitar on this whole tour. But since I had to play on a radio show, I had an excuse to bring it. You know, so I got that with me all the time. So <laughs> music is life. Music know? is life, and absolutely. Chicken or beef? Chicken. Chicken or beef? Shrimp. Coffee or tea? <laughs> Coffee. Sorry. Orange juice or apple juice? Orange juice. Dogs or cats? Is that even a question? Dogs or That's cats? That's like, who's better, the Beatles or Rolling Stones? Obviously the Beatles. Obviously cats. You had half of that right. <laughs> cats and the Rolling Stones. Hey, who's the guest here? You're the Oh, host. I'm sorry. Yeah, I know. Um, and our last question. To be or not to be? <laughs> God. Uh, you know the answer to that. <laughs> Come on. All right. We're going to say to be. To yes, be. To be. Oh, let's see. How long did you live in Germany as a child, and did that influence your life? Uh, my dad was an army doctor, and I was just a child there. I do have some memories. We left when I was four years old, just before that. But I'll tell you how it influenced my life. It influenced my life because both my parents were from the South, and had they not been there and served there, they would have had a more limited worldview. But mm -hmm. because they served in Germany and it, it's sort of at the epicenter of some things, um, they understood a lot about the Holocaust, and they understood a lot about the politics of fascism. And so when the civil rights issues reared their head in the 60s, they recognized that, and they knew a lot about it. And I was raised with that. And if you know a lot about Germany in the 1930s, some of the stuff that's happened in the last couple of years doesn't look too unfamiliar. It's scary. Anyway, sorry. Um, okay, we're going to have a phone call here pretty soon. Okay. So but we're going to keep on answering questions and signing books if you're good with that. How you doing? Billy Ray Farmer, do not call me. <laughs> you Sorry. heard it. You're dialing your phone right now, right? <laughs> what real life criminal investigation or trial do you think is the most interesting? Wow. Oh. I, I don't know. I don't know. That's something I would be hard to answer. You know, I'll tell you what's the most interesting to me. I don't know if it ever came to be a criminal trial, but the idea that Robert Oppenheimer lost his security clearance after playing a critical role in inventing the atomic bomb and winning the war is just unbelievable to me. And I would like to know all the in political ins and outs that went into stripping Robert Oppenheimer of his security clearance. That sounds like an interesting That's an esoteric book. answer, but yeah, that's... That sounds like a really interesting book if it hasn't already been written. Hmm. Always get good ideas. Um, this is Helen from Richmond. Oh, this is an easy one. As a Jacksonian who lived through the era and now is transplanted in a different world in California, I've been so grateful to have found these books. What is the correct order for reading them? I started in the middle, have gotten lost. Oh, okay. You got two choices. You can start with Natchez Burning. That's the start of the trilogy. Natchez Burning. The Bone Tree, Mississippi Blood. But if you really want to get the Penn story and that universe, you should start three books earlier. The Quiet Game, mm -hmm. Turning Angel, The Devil's Punch Bowl. But if you want the trilogy, you can start with Natchez Burning. Okay. Good. Um, well, we did that. We did that. That's I refreshed. Right. I'm sorry. I ran out of... Yeah, you're doing oh, good. Oh, there it is. Uh, Kathleen from Central City, Nebraska, raised up in the Delta, married a Nebraskan, missing the South every day. Your books are my connection to the swamp, the soft spe speech, the sounds, and the smells. My grown children still ask about those days when I was young. Penn Cage is a person we could sure use in D.C. these days. The struggle is real. Is real. Have you considered running for office? I got asked to run for office early on and at different times. And last year, I spent a good bit of time getting up the mayor of Natchez elected, helping him to get elected. Uh, I don't think that's really my calling to do that. I, I don't, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And I don't suffer fools gladly. None of us do, but you gotta, you gotta be diplomatic in politics to a degree. But something that comes out in her question is this, you know, all these questions about Mississippi. Here's what you find, people raised in Mississippi, I don't care where they settle, okay? 
they'll always tell you they're from Mississippi. Or they'll tell you, Natchez, if they're from Natchez, it will always be home to them. Now, everybody feels like that to a degree. You know, they're from the town that was their hometown. But sort of the American tradition is to outgrow your hometown, leave, settle in the city, and put it behind you. Mississippi's not that way. There's a quote in here that I'm assuming the title came from. Yeah, yeah. I wish I knew where it was. I'd read it. If somebody could hand me my iPad, I have it. Do you really? Yes, I forgot to that, put that's it over the here. That's the best line it is, in the whole book. It is phenomenal, and I think it would be a really great thing for us to read as we're starting to move into this. Um, and here's a, here's a good question while we're looking for it. Does the title Mississippi Blood refer to the family relationships Penn Cage is seeking to protect or the potential blood on his father's and the actual blood on his hands or all three? All of the above and more, you know. Uh, Mississippi Blood is, uh, you know, when you try to pin something like that down, it gets difficult, so I don't want to try to pin it down too much. But blood is such a symbolic thing. I mean, look just in the Christian church, what does blood symbolize? Sure. And blood itself is such a weird fundamental fluid. It's not really just a liquid. It's a tissue, you know, but it's just... Uh, it's a subject of fear, but mostly it's about the bond, I think, in the South. The bonds in the South are bonds of kinship and violence. And uh, here we go. All right, all right. I do like this. A lot of times I look at things I've written and I don't want to read them. All right, this was said by Uncle Catfish, Serenity <laughs> Butler's Uncle Catfish. She's an African-American writer who's probably a better writer than Penn in his career. And she repeats a quote her uncle said. I've been all over the South, man, cutting pulp wood and playing the blues. Mississippi blood is different. It's got some river in it, delta soil, turpentine, asbestos, cotton poison. But there's strength in it, too. Strength that's been beat but not broke. That's Mississippi blood. And that's true whether you're white or black from Mississippi, yeah. you know? I, just, I love that. I love well, that. I'm glad that you picked that out. Absolutely that perfect. Um, hey, we've got a phone call. Oh, boy. <laughs> All right. Kim from Horton, Alabama is on the line. Hi, Kim. Here's Greg. Hi. Hey, Kim. Where's Horton, Alabama? What are you close to? Uh, let's see. I am close to Gunnersville, like Gunnersville. And what's Gunnersville yeah. close to? I'm sorry. Uh, about mm, close to Huntsville. I got you. Okay. I was just there. Yeah. All right. Well, what's yes, your question, Kim? I missed it. <laughs> I'm sorry. What's your question? Okay, uh, let's see. There's an element of truth in all stereotypes. However, what misconception about the South would you like to change? Wow. Okay. Yeah, in some ways the South in Mississippi totally lives up to its stereotype every day. You're right. The flip side is we, the South is much deeper than the stereotype and the contradictions inherent therein are very complex. And I would like to say, for example, Charles Evers, both Charles Evers and James Brown said that having experienced the North, they preferred to deal often with whites from the South, because even if they were dealing with a racist white person, they knew that that person would follow through with their word. If they made a promise, they would live up to it. And there was nothing occult, nothing hidden about the racism. Whereas in the North, people from the North would smile, shake their hand, act warm, and then stab them in the back, possibly. And so the thing I want to correct about the South is that what I touched on earlier, race is not, racism is not a Southern problem. It's an American problem. And to pick on the South because racism here is overt rather than covert just muddies the water. So that was a great question. Wow. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Sorry I missed you in Huntsville. <laughs> Rocket City. Okay, so the, this is a good this is a good follow up on this. Okay. Chris Barnett from Trustville, Alabama. Do you ever get any animosity from towns and places that might not come off in a positive light? You know, I <laughs> I told a funny story about that today. I probably don't want to put that out on the internet, but uh, 
A reviewer once said, Greg Isles does Natchez the backhanded compliment of setting his novels there. Okay? <laughs> but a friend of mine said about Natchez, Greg, you know in Natchez they'll forgive you for everything except going bankrupt. Now, what I've learned is fame is fame, notoriety is notoriety. And in general, people are just, a lot of tourism has come to Natchez because mm -hmm. of that. And people in the South, look, people in the South, for the most part, are ready to deal with what this stuff is. They've been dealing with it for a long time. It's not a big problem. Now, there are the sort of diehards who say, I don't, you ain't got no business dragging up these old murders and uh, don't do anybody any good, just makes things worse. Well, my answer to that is very simple. If it was your mama or your brother or your daddy who got brutally murdered and nobody ever lifted a finger, you'd be singing a different tune. That's pretty simple. I want to know, out of all your books, who do you think your creepiest character is? My creepiest character? Creepiest character. The killer in mortal fear, uh, without question. Oh. And the, the, by the way, a lot of people ask me, is Pen Cage me? Pen Cage is not me. But Harper Cole in mortal fear is very close to me. So if you're looking for clues to my weird psyche, mortal fear contains a lot. Chad Cruzy. Do you check the VM of the phone number used in the book? <laughs> you, I, I take it you know what that is. Okay, I'm yeah, glad. Yeah, let's just, it I had really, a name on it. I figured, we, we, oh, we, he knows. Mostly not. Once I use one of my own phone numbers, um, I'm, not even, I'm not even sure about the last oh, time Oh, VM, I did voicemail. <laughs> oh, no, I don't do that. Dang. No. Oh, I thought he was talking about like the actual location of the number and who has it. No, I don't check the uh, voicemail. Oh. <laughs> Oh, uh, Cosette Thomas wants to know, do you recommend people read the first Pen Cage book before they start the Natchez Burning Trilogy? Well, it would certainly be a richer experience if you do. You certainly don't have to. And I even took care of Mississippi Blood. I know a certain number of people are just going to buy it in the store without even thinking it's a trilogy. So I want people to be able to pick up each one and at least you, not be lost. You do a brilliant job of that. I try. You do it I, don't, I don't know. For, uh, no, as a series writer, one of the hardest things is giving enough information without yep. giving everything away. And it's the kiss of death to go back and give too much. Yeah, and you don't want to just be dumping out all of that. Exposition there are some of series, I'm not going to name any names, but there are some series that I used to admire greatly. And then I got to like book seven or eight, and I realized they're like cut and pasting whole paragraphs of exposition from earlier books. You know, it's like, all right, that's too, that's too lazy. <laughs> that's a for little me. too much. Yeah. Um, well, that's a great jump off for Joe, Joe Rawhoff from Columbus, Mississippi. You wrote in Mississippi Blood that Penn can judge a book from the first few sentences. Is that how you feel? Absolutely. Uh, what I say all, all the time, this is true. I'm going to sign a few more books there. Um, Which you can get at MississippiBlood.com. If I, I know this from, okay, if I tell you I can sing, everybody out there, I tell you I can sing, how many seconds do I have to sing before you tell me I can sing or I can't sing? Three seconds, mm -hmm. four seconds. Writing isn't any different. We think it's different. Everybody thinks it's different because they can write a letter, a sermon, a legal brief, whatever. That's got nothing to do with storytelling, okay? And so what storytelling is about is the ability to lure people along, but it's really about having a voice. So, yes, I can read one page of anything anybody wrote and say, does this person have a voice or not? Same way I can hear them sing four bars of amazing grace or you know i feel good whatever you either know they got it or they don't is there anything better in the world than opening that book and Whew. reading that first page and knowing you're in the hands of a master and you can just relax nothing's better and it happens so, so rarely, rarely now so, so rarely. when you open something now and read a first line and you realize you're just in the hands of a master even if it's their first book if they got it they got it yeah. and you just hey okay i can chill you know. What is your favorite TV show of all time, and what's your favorite recent show? Uh, my favorite recent show is, I'm going to cheat, Vikings Season 1 and 2, True <laughs> Detective Season 1, Poldark Season 1 and 2. I love Poldark. Uh, I got a lot of favorite shows right now. Favorite mo the show that inspired me the most probably all the way back was uh, Star Trek Original Series. Uh, they did so much with so little in so few years, right. and I think they inspired more 
millions of people. They did for writers and creative people what the Beatles did for, you know, generations of musicians, you know. That's awesome. We've got about 10 more minutes. Okay. And so we're going to wrap up with a couple of last questions. Um, who came up with the name of your band? It's genius. Which band? Uh, the Rock Bottom Remainders or Frankly Scarlet? Uh, it does not say. Those are both genius. They're both <laughs> genius. <laughs> Let me guess, you did them both. I came up with, no, I didn't come up with the Rock Bottom Remainders. Oh, okay. I came up with Frankly Scarlet, which is self-explanatory. But Rock Bottom Remainders, they were called that before I got in the band. And for those who don't know, Rock Bottom Remainders mm -hmm. are the books like this that right now are what, $28 or something. And in a year and a half will be $4 in the bin at Barnes & Noble. <laughs> Those are rock bottom remainders. And so this band of luminaries, literary luminaries, uh, call themselves the rock bottom remainders. That's awesome. Um, let's see. Are you going to write any more science fiction? Yes. Nice. I, my publisher just went like this. No. <laughs> I, I, it may be on the screen rather than in a book, but I'm definitely doing it. Best idea I've ever come up with is sci-fi. Anyway, go ahead. Really? Yeah. Bar none. Um, wow. We are, I think that's in a good spot for that. So I'm going to ask one or two of my last questions because um, did you, have you read anything really great lately? You're on tour and it's hard to, to do that. You Plus, I'm, honestly, I'm getting old. Now. I'm having eye issues. It really, for me to read something all the way to the end now, it's got to be worth the be investment. Really good. I like the series, the Guards series by a guy named Ken Bruin, an Irish writer. Yeah, I, I know Ken. Do you? Yes, I do. I love his books. I reread the Master and Commander books every two or three years because they're such a tour de force of writing technique. Matterhorn, Carl Marlantes. Uh, I think there's a book called Six Weeks in a Conquered City. By anonymous, it's first person by a woman who survived the Russian occupation of Berlin. Shattering book, and some of the best first person ever. May not be six weeks, maybe eight weeks. Anyway, that's enough of that. So, you, do you prefer fiction or nonfiction? Um, it's just everything. I mean, you know, just like I said, yeah. just you got to have input, 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 input. I drive down the road to my wife, going, "Tell me something. Tell me something. What are you thinking? What's on Twitter? I mean, I just." <laughs> Come on. We're consumers. Yeah. Um, then I think the last question. All right. And I've asked you this before, but I love your answer. Um, what do you feel the role of the novel is in today's society? The role of the novel in today's society is shrinking. Um, I, I don't have anything really profound to say about that, except we've gotten very passive in how we consume. You know, you want to just sit down and turn on True Detective or whatever it is, and that's a passive investment. Mm -hmm. You just lay back like William Hurt and Big Chill and say, sometimes you just have to let art flow over you, man. You know, we <laughs> go into that mode. Books require active engagement, mm -hmm. but they're like music was before videos. Your mind does half the work, three quarters of the work. You bring who you are to that and you, weave the tapestry with the writer and man you don't want to lose that that that'll keep you from getting alzheimer's in my opinion i mean it's just the best it's the best thing there is and you will never be bored in your life now in the 40s and 50s and whatever the novel was the great american art form it's not film is the great american mm -hmm. art form now and that's just the way it is and i accept that but don't give up on the novel that's what i would say well i think that's a really great place for us to stop because yep. this is a novel and a set of trilogies and a writer who is doing it right. So if you want to read a novel that is really going to blow your socks off, Mississippi Blood is it. Go to MississippiBlood.com. Greg's going out on tour. You need to come and see him and get your book signed and talk to him because he has important things to say that we all need to hear. And read J.T. Ellison and Stanley Nelson and buy some more books on <laughs> the site. Buy some more books here. Thanks, you guys. It was great. Thank you. Thanks, JT. You're great awesome. Great time. Thank you.